Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm wore out. I'm not going to hold you long. <clears throat> Turn with me to Deuteronomy. I'm not going to hold you long. If anybody leaves, <clears throat> I got a photographic memory and I'm watching all the doors. Deuteronomy 32. I want to bring a message that I feel like goes along real well with the day. <clears throat> I feel like something's up. How many of you have ever been over a ride where you'd lose your stomach and it tickles? Before revival broke out, this is no joke, before revival broke out, I was going through hell with my mother and different things. But during the day, there would be episodes where I would have that that would last an hour at a time. Where it'd be like I was going over a speed bump real fast and lose my stomach. And I thought, well, Lord, what does that mean? <clears throat> I'm still having it. It means something's up. I've got it right now. Deuteronomy 32, <clears throat> verse 11. Hand me that mic there. Deuteronomy 32. Is that better? Chapter 32, don't mess me up, guys. Verse 11. As an eagle stirreth up her nest and fluttereth over her young and spreads abroad her wings, taketh them beneath them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. I want to look at verse 11, and I want to bring out about four or five points quickly. It says, as an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, and then takes them and bears them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him and there was no strange God with him. You may be seated. Just for a little while, and I'll go through this as quickly as I can because I know that the hour is getting late. There's about five points that I want to bring out about this scripture alone this morning. I want to speak to you for a little while today about eagles. Are I might also speak about God's dealings with humanity, God's way of dealing with humanity. You see, I know today that there are people in this room that God has his hand on your life. I know there's people in the choir that God has his hand on your life. There's people up in the balcony. You've had an experience with God a long time ago. Some of you right now are having a renewed experience with God. People out on this main floor, something going on in your life, and I want to help you this morning understand a little bit about what's going on in your life. The eagle is very strong and very powerful in her wing. She builds her nest on high places. She builds her nest in very high trees or on high rocky ledges. And she builds her nest with sticks, briars, thorns, and then she covers it with rags, skins of animals, and soft downy feathers. Not only does the eagle love the height, but that's where she builds her nest, way up high. And the way she starts off her nest is she builds it with briars, thorny things, prickly things, sharp objects. That's the way she builds the base and the foundation of her nest. And then she goes 
and she will kill an animal and bring the meat to her children. And she'll take the skin of that dead animal and she'll stuff it around those briars. And she'll take pieces of paper, old rags that she will find by her sharp vision. And she will bring it up to that ledge where that nest is and she'll make it very soft and comfortable. She'll take downy feathers and she'll make it very fluffy and very comfortable for those little eaglets. Then the eagle hatches her eggs and brings up her little ones in that nest. Now the eagle is a wonderful mother and the Bible tells us that God speaks of himself many times and relates to himself as a mother eagle. God here in Deuteronomy chapter 32, we find one of those places where the Lord makes mention of it. He says, as an eagle stirs up her nest and flutters over her young and spreads abroad her wings and takes them and bears her little eaglets on her wings, so I did lead Jacob. God relates to himself like an eagle, and what God is saying here is there's a hidden truth. That God's saying as she stirs up her nest, and it has something to do with the way an eagle builds her nest. Not only will that eagle hatch her eggs, and as she's bringing up her little eaglets, she begins to nurture them, she begins to feed them, and once those little eagles begin to get some age on them, she will take them and she will begin to make the nest uncomfortable. She will stir up. The first point I want to bring out today is the eagle will stir up her nest. She uses her claws to remove comfortable things from the nest. As the eaglets begin to grow, the mother eagle will begin to take her claws and she'll begin to remove some feathers in the top layer. And she'll take her beak and begin to pick out those soft downy feathers that makes that nest so comfortable. And then after a while, as the, the pricks and the briars begin to prick through and make the little baby eagles uncomfortable, the mother will then go even deeper with some time with her talons and some time with her beak, and she'll begin to remove other items of comfort in that nest. She may remove a rag, or she may pluck out a skin of an animal until after a while those briars and those pricks are really sticking out and they're pronounced. And as that eagle tries, that little baby eagle tries to sit down and be comfortable like it always has and have dinner brought to it and have mom come up on the perch and just come in with live food and put it in their mouth and all they've got to do is sit there in that comfort and eat that food, that fresh food. Mama begins to make the nest uncomfortable and God calls it stirring up her nest and she leaves only the sharp briars. And the little eaglets become very uneasy and sometimes they become scared because all they've ever known was the comfort and the ease of home. Now all of a sudden, mother has messed things up. And God said in Deuteronomy, I am like that mother eagle. I'm the one that stirs up the nest. And I want to tell you this morning, friend, there's some of you some of you watching me by television right now, there's some of you that God, even as a teenager, laid his hand on your life and he called you. God laid his hand on you and God tabbed you for the ministry. He marked you. But many of you are doing other things that God never called you to do. You learned the taste of the world. You learn the smells of the world. You learn the down of the nest. You learn the comfort. You learn to get comfortable in the real estate. You learn the comfort of settling down in the business and climbing the ladder. You learn what it means to have more than enough and to be able to bank some money. And when you think of the ministry, you keep putting it off. 
So now they're uncomfortable. And not only does God do that in people in regard to the ministry, but sometimes God does that in terms of people whenever he gets ready to change them. Whenever God gets ready to move you. Whenever God gets ready to make a change in your life. And I want to tell you, there's some of you here today, you need to literally interpret what I'm preaching literally because God's trying to talk to you. There's some others. You're just going to have to sort through this and see what the Holy Spirit's telling you. But I do know beyond any doubt that as I preach this morning that the Holy Ghost is talking to some of you and he's trying to help you interpret the change that's going on in your life. Some of you want to curse the change that's going on in your life right now. You want to curse it. But God says don't curse the briars. God said don't curse the thorns. The Lord says simmer down. Be still and begin to interpret what I'm trying to say to you. Don't curse it. Don't put your head in the sand and hide your head and act like everything's okay. You know that there are briars that are pricking up out of the nest now and God has removed some comforts and God has removed some ease and you're beginning to feel uneasy. Change. God's stirring up the nest. I like the second point. It says she flutters over her young. What that means is she will rise up sometime above her nest and she will flutter her wings. She will put them out like that and she'll flutter them. She won't spread them out. But she'll rise up high on her legs above the little eaglets and she'll flutter her wings like that. And what she's trying to tell the eaglets is, I know you're uncomfortable. I know that you're sitting on some thorns and I know you're being pricked and I know you're uneasy. And so the language of the mother eagle is to rise up like this above her little eaglets and flutter her wings, and that's eagle language to those little baby eagles. It's okay. Don't be insecure. I just want you to be uncomfortable. I want you to be comfort. I want you to be secure in knowing that mama is here. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you, says the Lord, but I will make you uneasy. And so she will rise up, that mother eagle will, and she'll begin to flutter her wings. And she's saying in eagle language, everything is all right. Mother's here. Don't get alarmed. Don't get scared. I'm here. And she'll flutter her wings to give them that accompanying secure sound that she will be bringing food and she will be continuing to be there with them to protect them and to watch over them. But I know you're uneasy and I know you're uncomfortable, but mama's here. It's all right. The third thing that I like is so wonderful. The third thing is it said she spreads abroad her wings. Oh, my. How I love this part. See, not only will the mother begin to pluck out the cloth and the rags and the downy feathers and make them uncomfortable. And not only will she flutter over them, but as those eaglets become so uncomfortable and so anxious knowing that something's up, mother, listen to me, mother won't do this until it's time for mother to do this. Mother will not spread forth her wings while the comfort and the down is still in the nest. Mother won't spread her wings then. It won't be appreciated. Mother will wait until she takes her talons and her beak and begins to remove the comfort and begins to make her little family uncomfortable. And after she's fluttered over them and let them know, I haven't left you. I will never leave you. Mama's still here, but I want you to get the picture of what, I, what Mama's trying to say to you. Mama wants you to know I'm here, and I won't forsake you. I'm going to still feed you, and I'm going to still take care of you. But then after a while, when enough time goes by, Mama wants those baby eaglets to become so uncomfortable that they want to begin to leave the nest. And if they won't leave the nest, I used to raise pigeons when I was a boy, 
I had a pigeon pen in my backyard. I kept it immaculate. I had racing homing pigeons. We could take them on the top of Pine Mountain in Callaway Gardens in Georgia with binoculars. And with a telescope, I could let my pigeons go. And I could watch them fly all the way down toward Columbus. And through a telescope, I could watch them as they began to circle above my pigeon pen. And as they would take wing and come in and land and go in the pigeon roost. I had some of the most beautiful pigeons. They were racing homing pigeons. I loved them. But I learned something about a pigeon. I learned that a pigeon, just like an eagle, a bird, at times they will make their little nest uncomfortable. And if they can't get those little pigeons out of the nest, that mother will take her folded wings. And those folded wings are very muscular and powerful. And she can spread them out like that and slap that child. <laughs> like that. I know whenever they had the eggs and they'd be sitting on the eggs, I'd reach my hand under there to see how the eggs were doing. And as I'd reach my hand under there, the mother would take that beak and many times peck the blood out of me. And many times I'd feel the fury of her wing and she'd pop me with that wing. And she'd just keep popping me with that wing. And eventually I'd move, remove my hand, but it would sting as that mother would pop me with that wing. Very powerful. Can't you imagine an eagle? And as that mother eagle would make that nest really uncomfortable, if the little eaglets wouldn't begin to get up off those briars and to begin to move, sometime mama would begin to withhold food. It may sound like a painful thing to do, but many times mama would begin to withhold the food and there would be times that she knew it was time for them to come out of that nest. Don't stay there. It's not normal for you to stay in that nest that long. And as that baby would want to continue to settle down, after a while they would even get used to the pricks and the thorns and the briars. They would begin to build up scar tissue and their, their, their skin would begin to thicken and they'd begin to make their own little comfort areas, even in spite of the briars. But mama would not let them rest. Mama would begin to withhold the food where they would have to begin to get up and they'd have to begin to exert themselves. And many times she'd take that wing and pop them and slap them with that wing to get them out of that nest. But it wasn't until it was time that Mama would do something, and this is the part that I love, friend. Mama wouldn't just rise up above that nest and flutter her wings. But Mama would rise up above that nest and extend her wing. She would do that several times a day. As the little eagle would sit there, they would look it up. What is mama doing? Because they'd never seen mama with her wings spread like that. They'd always seen mama, she was flying in and she was coming in and her wings were behind her. And she had food in the mouth. But they'd never seen mama have that kind of power. They didn't know mama was that strong. Have you ever seen the wing spread of an eagle? If you've ever seen a dead eagle, or even a live eagle, you can take their wings and spread them out, and sometime they're six, nine foot long. And did you know in Asia, they have an eagle there that has a wing spread of 14 feet long. And that mother would not only get above that nest and flutter her wings to let them know that she was there, but after a while, when it really became uncomfortable, and I want everybody to listen to this point, after a while, when things really became uncomfortable enough, and it was time, see, there's a time for everything, and it was time, Mama would not just flutter her wings, but Mama would stand up on her talons, and she would extend forth her wings like that, and those baby eagles would look up, and they'd never seen Mother with all that power. And they looked from one edge of the wingspan to the other edge of the wingspan. Because the only way they had ever seen Mama was when she was coming in and the wings were behind her. But now they were seeing a different side of Mama in their uneasiness and their discomfort. And what that mother eagle was trying to show those babies is, I want to show you that Mama is here, but I also want to show you that Mama is powerful. And I'm about to put you in a position. Before I put you in this position, where you're going to be insecure, you're going to have some insecure feelings.
mind, the rug is going to be snatched out from under you before I do that to you, and I am going to do that to you. I want to first of all fix an image in your little minds, children, that you've seen mama one way up until now, but now I'm about to change in your life, and before I snatch the rug out from under you, I want to show you my power. those wings like that and those little baby eaglets would take it in wow look at mama's power wow and then the bible says if you notice the next point look at this it said that she spreads abroad her wings but look at the next point you know what she would do The mother eagle would come up beside the nest, be it on a ledge or be it on a tree. Mama would get out on the edge of a limb right by the nest, and Mama would stretch forth one of her long wings like that. And she would lay that wing down by the nest, and in eagle language she would say, Get off the briar and get on the wing." Mama would stretch forth that wing and lay it out, and she would say, Children, have you noticed something unusual lately? Children, have you noticed I removed your comfort zone? Children, have you noticed I have removed everything that made you feel comfortable and settled and fixed? and at ease. Yes, mommy. Children, did I not flutter over your nest to let you know that mama's here and mama has not abandoned you? Yes, mommy. Children, have I not stretched forth my wings and let you see my power and my glory? Yes, mama. Well, children, Get off the briars and get on my wings. And the little baby eaglets would very insecurely begin to move out of that nest and take their little baby talons and begin to move up on mama's wings, up toward the back solid part of her body. And one by one, they'll begin to leave that nest. And they'll climb up on mama's feathers and on her strong wings, up on her back. Suddenly, mama does something that is so unbelievable. Mama lunges forward. And the babies do like this. And they dig their talons deep in mama's feathers. And mama lunges out of the nest and lunges off the ledge. And mama takes off soaring. And as mama takes off soaring, she has those baby eaglets on her back and she spreads those wings way out. And flying like a bullet into the wild blue yonder with those little babies on her back, she will go up and she will dive. She will turn And she'll catch the wind, and she'll let that wind hit those little eaglets, and she'll let them feel that wind coming past them, and she'll let them catch a vision of what it means to soar. She will turn. She'll pivot. She will move. And then after just a short period of time, she'll come back, and she'll land in the nest, and she'll extend forth her wing, and they'll climb off. And when they climb off, they climb right back onto the briars. Mama has fixed them a picture. Look what it can be like. And if you don't do this, look what you've got to go back to. The next day, Mama will come in. 
And the babies have now got a taste of the air. And the babies have now got a taste of the wild blue yonder. And they've now got a taste of the height and the soaring. And now they've had to sleep on that nest overnight again. And they feel the pricks and the thorns. And mama comes in the next day and she extends her wing down. And the baby eaglets, some of them comes out and jumps up on the wing readily. Others want to stay in the nest and she'll say, pew, pew, pew. and she'll pop them around a time or two. And first news you know, they crawl out and all of them get so mama's back again. And phew, she lunges out again. And she soars into the wild blue yonder, and there's those little eaglets up there on Mama's back. And she's soaring, going higher and higher. And the little eaglets are saying, wow, boy, isn't this a life. And after just a little while, she'll come back down to the nest and extend her wing and put them right back in the nest. And after a while, they begin to learn the lesson. It's comfortable up there. But when we come back here, I don't like it anymore. And the Bible said that not only does she spread forth her wing, and not only does she flutter over the nest to let them know she's there, and not only does she make the nest uncomfortable, but the Bible says she takes them. She extends that wing and she takes them on her wing. And she securely teaches them how to soar. Let me leave that for just a moment. I want to show you a picture. Let me just choose Israel, and I could choose many of people in the Bible. I could choose you. But let me just choose Israel for a moment. Bible says God called Israel to be a chosen people. God wanted to make them an earmark and a hallmark of a peculiar and a blessed people on the earth. But they said, no. God said, farm the land and let the land rest. No, they wouldn't listen to God. God said, I want to be your God, and I don't want you going whoring after other gods. I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people. They said, no. So God said, i tell you what I want to do, because you won't let me do what I want to do in your life. God put them in Egypt. And the Bible says when God put Israel in Egypt that they flourished. They found a nest comfort zone. They found a nest that had been prepared for them, and God said, just like an eagle stirs up her nest, God fixed a nest for Israel right in the middle of Egypt. And you don't know, as a matter of fact, God sent Joseph to Egypt, you remember. And after God sent Joseph to Egypt, God fed his children. God blessed his children. But now here they are in Egypt permanently, and their nest is so comfortable, and they're flourishing. And the Pharaoh is very favorable to them, and everything is hunky-dory. But one day, Pharaoh dies. And when Pharaoh dies, God started the process of stirring up Israel's nest. Yes. And God began to reach down with his talons, and he pulled out an animal skin here. He reached down with his beak and he pulled out a rag there. God took the breath of his nostrils and blew the downy feathers away. And Israel all of a sudden had a Pharaoh that was not favorable. And God began to stir up the nest because it wasn't God's will to leave them in Egypt. God said, I've got a land for you, a land prepared with milk and honey, and I've got things for you that you know not of. But this is not my will for you. I just put you here for a while, and I kept you here for a while. This was my will for a while, but now I want to lead you into the promised land. And so God began to stir up Israel's nest, and a Pharaoh arose who was not favorable to them. And I want to tell you, friend, there will come times in your life that God will let radical, abrupt changes take place, and the Holy Spirit is trying to speak to you. I, the Lord your God, am stirring up your nest. This is not my place. This is not my time. And this is not my geographic location for you. And the next thing it said was, the nest, the, the eagle will flutter over her nest. You know what God's fluttering was? The Bible says that they begin to beat the Israelis. 
They worked them under taskmasters. They had to make bricks out of straw and mud. And they were multiplying exceedingly, but all of a sudden Egypt turned against them and they began to be whipped. They began to be abused. And you know what God did? Now remember the mother eagle, you know what she will do? She'll flutter over the nest. What does the fluttering mean? Mama's here. Shh, everything's okay. Mama's here. As Israel was going through their stirring of the nest, God said, now I've stirred your nest and I've let you fill the briars. But the Lord says, now I want to flutter over you. You know what he did? He sent Moses into Egypt. And when Moses came on the scene, his presence as a deliverer said to the children of Israel, shh, Father's with us. Father has not left us alone. Father has come to us to show us that he's with us. Let me stop here and just make this personal. Friends, some of you are going through some trying times, emotional roller coasters up and down. I've been there, I know. Some of you are going through some crises in your life and God's stirring up your nest. But I want to tell you, if you haven't seen it yet, I want to just tell you, just be confident and be quiet and simmer down and settle down because God next is going to flutter over you to let you know, I have not forsaken you. Shh, I'm with you. Be quiet. Amen. So Moses came on the scene, and one day there was this guy come in with this rod. And he walked into Pharaoh's court, and he shouted out, and he had Aaron and his brother with him, and he said, God says, the I am, says, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no. But Israel had seen enough of the fluttering of the Lord that they knew in their time of crisis that at least God was with them. But now let me take you to the next point, and this is the point that I love. You remember? That eagle, not only would she flutter and let them know that mama was there and all was well, but she would stretch forth her wings and show them her power at the right time. When Moses walked in, he had a rod, and in that rod there was what? Moses said to Pharaoh, God said, let him go. And Pharaoh said, no. So some miracles started taking place in Pharaoh's before his throne. And the magicians threw their rod down, you remember. And they became snakes. Wouldn't that be something interesting to see? See a stick hit the cobblestone floor and all of a sudden turn into a crawling snake. But I'm going to tell you, God has a way of stretching his wings. <laughs> And Moses threw his rod down. But his rod became a snake also. But it wasn't a moccasin or a rattlesnake or any other kind of snake. You know what kind of snake it was? It was a king snake. And a king snake eats the other snakes. And Moses' rod, Moses' snake ate their snakes. And Pharaoh said, mm-hmm. You know what that was? That was God stretching forth his wings. And he was saying, I am the great I am. Fear not, my people. Fear not, my child. Not only am I stirring up your nest, it's not time to bring you out just yet. I'm not just stirring up your nest, and I'm not just fluttering over you to let you know that I'm with you, but there is a time and there is a place, and I want you to know before I bring you out that I am the Lord God, and all power has been given unto me in heaven and earth. And I want to tell you something else, friend. Listen to me. America has been in a soft, downy nest. America has been peaceful and tranquil. We haven't had a war since Vietnam. The stock market has been going up, 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 up. We went over to Iraq. We whipped them in the desert. Everybody started praying when the war took off. When the war was won in just a matter of a few hours, they came back home and America went back to her nest of comfort and ease. But God lately has been reaching down in the nest of America and God has been withdrawing and removing the skins and the rags, and the down, and America has had everything. She's had the women. She's had the lovers with men. We've had the
the homosexuals come out of the closets. We've had wine running our streets. We've had all these things, times of peace, but we have not been happy. And God has said, I've been removing these things from the nest of America. You become too comfortable and you still have everything. But I'm removing these things of comfort and I'm showing you that I am the Lord God. And without me, life will not work. Yes. And America lately has been going through one thing after the other. Fires, floods, blizzards, hurricanes, tornadoes, sabotage. Hostage taking, cults rampant, churches declining, homes breaking up, babies being murdered. God is removing the down and the rags from the nest of America. And you know where I see America today, neighbor? I see America today in the last few years that God has rose up above our nest where we become uncomfortable and he's just fluttered a little bit. And he's risen up and he said, fear not, America. I have not left you and I have not reserved you for judgment. And he just fluttered a little bit and he went off. But we're still miserable and we're still uncomfortable. It just hasn't been our time. But, <laughs> but now, I see the Lord in the last few months beginning not just to remove our comfort zones and not just begin to flutter over us to let us know that he's with us, but I begin to see the Lord stretch forth those mighty wings. And you know, the symbol for America is the eagle. And I begin to see the Lord stretching forth his wings, that huge wingspan from the west coast to the east coast. And then he'll turn around and he'll stretch it out from the Gulf Coast to the Canadian border. And God is stretching forth those wings. And he's saying to America again, I have not left you, I have not left you, I have not reserved you for judgment, but before I take you and snatch the rug out from under you, I want you to know all power has been given unto me. And I wanna tell you something, friend. Listen to me, the hope for America is not on the steps of the state capitol in Montgomery, Alabama. The hope for America is not in the Supreme Court of the United States of America. The hope for America is in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he's stretching forth his wings. And he's saying, here I am, look. And all of a sudden, America sees a Steve Hill get on the air. Brash, uncouth, not a speck of religion on him. Like a Jonathan Edwards, like a John R. Charles Wesley, like a George Whitfield, like a man from the ancient past. And he goes up to Montgomery, Alabama, and he says, America, get out of your lazy boy. America, put your beer cans down and listen up. And he begins to talk about repentance. And through that 60 million viewers on television, God once again stretched forth his wings and said, America, I am your only hope. When we begin to watch these baptisms out of this baptismal pool on Friday night, what I begin to envision lately is, as they talk about homosexuality, lesbianism, drug addiction, alcoholism, and they begin to give God glory, I'm beginning to see and to hear from that baptismal pool that God is stretching out his wings across America and he's beginning to show his power now. God is not just letting us know in America that he's with us. That's wonderful. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. Thank you, Lord, for making us uncomfortable. Thank you, Lord, for fluttering over us and giving us the confidence that you're with us. But, friend, it's not enough to be with us. 
Lord, rise up on our behalf and deliver your people. All of a sudden now, America is beginning to see the outstretched wings of the Lord, and God's beginning to show forth his power again. And now we realize it's not in computers. Now we realize it's not in the internet. Now we realize it's not in the universities. Now we realize it's not in the think tanks of the colleges and the universities around America. And we realize it's not in the White House because the White House, America, has never been so disen disenchanted with the White House as they are today. People have lost confidence in their government. So it has to be from somewhere else. It's not a Ronald Reagan in there anymore. It's not a Truman in there anymore. And it's not a Lincoln in there anymore. It's somebody in there that they say, well, at least he can help us prosper, but we don't have a bit of confidence in his integrity. And so America's been on the lookout for someone or something to put their confidence in. But friend, I'm gonna tell you that's been the problem. They've been looking for a long time at someone to put their confidence in. But God has removed all those someones except one, and he's Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, all of a sudden, the Lord is beginning to stretch forth his wings, and he's beginning to show us how powerful he is. You know what the next step is? I can envision in the near future, and I believe that the power of this revival and the revival now that's going on around the world, I believe that it's going to pick up. Mike told me last night, he said that there's over 600 scriptures in the Bible that seems to indicate that there will be a last day major move of God on the earth before the coming of the Lord. Over 600 scriptures seem to indicate that before the Lord comes back, there will be a major end-time revival before the Lord comes back. I believe with all my heart, just hear me out, this is my vision. I believe that the Lord now has come in a time or two and he's spread forth his wings and he's saying, look, look and see what I'm able to do. We hear from that baptismal pool that it wasn't a program. It wasn't a six-step program. It wasn't this agency, and it wasn't that, and it wasn't that church of this ministry. It was the Lord. And I'm beginning now to begin to see that God is stretching forth his wings, and he's beginning to show his power again in America. You see, in the 40s, there was a ten evangelist that God began to raise up. A. A. Allen, Jack Cole, Oral Roberts. And in the 40s, in the last major move of God that we had, God began to send out these deliverance ministers across America in tents, and they would preach the word, and people would be healed, and demons would be cast out. And America saw something it had never seen before, the delivering power of God, and it was happening under old tents with sawdust floors. But now, right before his coming, God's doing something different. It's strange, and it's going to be more mighty than anything I believe that America's ever seen. But right now we're still in the wing stage where God's just stretching forth his wings and saying, I haven't snatched the rug out yet, but I just want to show you who I am, and I want to show you that you can trust me. But friend, hear me and hear me good. The last thing that the mother eagle teaches her little eaglets is this. Once she teaches them how to soar, you can look up there and you can see the mother eagle flying and you can see the little baby eagles learning to fly with her. You can look up there and see it. The little babies are much smaller. But she's taught them how to soar. But that's not enough. The last thing that the mother teaches those eaglets is this. See, the eagle has sharp ear hearing and very sharp eyesight. An eagle can stare with her eyes open into the sun without blinking. An eagle has such great hearing that it can hear something way before a human can hear it. And with her perch way up high, she can see and hear a storm coming long before it ever gets there. And the last thing that the mother eagle teaches her little eaglets how to do is to catch the storm before it ever gets there and to catch that draft and that velocity of the wind that always precedes the storm, and to use that velocity of that wind to shoot up like a bullet and sail above the storm before it comes. 
Do you get the picture? The Lord has filled our Bible with prophecies. Zechariah, Isaiah, the book of the Revelation, many other books in your Bible is filled with books of prophecies about the soon coming of our Lord. I don't know about you, but I feel like a mother eagle right now. And I feel like I'm up on a ledge. And I feel like the Lord is right there with us. And he's saying, son, I want to show you how to bear your breast in the wind. Stick out your chest. Don't be afraid of the coming storm. As the wind will precede that storm coming, bear your chest. Stretch out your wings. And as the wind begins to pick up and the velocity of the wind begins to blow, stretch your wings and catch that draft and shoot up like a bullet and miss that storm. Hear me? In the very near future, the rug is going to be snatched out from America. Absolutely going to be snatched out. And everything that America has had their confidence in is going to be gone. And the Bible tells us that before the Antichrist comes, there will be a false prophet. He said there's going to be earthquakes, there's going to be wars, rumors of wars, there's going to be pestilence, there's going to be all kinds of things taking place. And we're up on this pinnacle, and the wind is beginning to pick up. And the Lord says, the last thing I want to teach you is this, before the storm comes, son, don't be afraid of it, but bear your chest in the wind and stretch your wings and escape the coming storm. And I leave this with you. I'm not looking for Antichrist. I don't believe my eyes will ever see him. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. And friend, I'm not looking for the tribulation. And I'm one of those preachers that always preached, and I always will believe unless somebody can really show me different that I believe that the rapture of the church takes place before the tribulation. But I can tell you I hear the hoofbeats of the horsemen of the apocalypse, and my eyes can reach way out yonder, and I can see a swirl of dust beginning to come across America. And I see the Lord saying, Son, get ready and tell the church, the little eaglets, to get ready and move out on the ledge and bear their chest in the wind and begin to spread their wings and get ready to escape the judgment that's to come. Would you stand, please?